Good morning. I want to talk today a little bit about psychological fallacies, illusions, and in particular their relationship to fears. Um, and this is all tied into the stories that we tell ourselves. And my aim in, in offering this to you is to try and help you to find a little bit of perspective, a little bit of distance from your thoughts. Because we all kind of think that our thoughts are us. We all identify, well, I say we all, I'm assuming there, right? But it seems to be the case that we identify with our thoughts like they're us. But my, here's my first question, you know, who chooses our thoughts? Do we choose our thoughts? I, I'm not sure we do, you know. I kind of have this feeling that there are many, many thoughts going on in this. And some of them, for whatever reason, bubble up to my awareness. And my consciousness kind of goes, yeah, that's me. Personally, I have a story running inside my head that the brain is a risk management machine, that it's looking out for me to make sure that I survive. And so that explains to me why a lot of the thoughts that come tend to be cautionary, let's say. Whether that's definitively the case or not is debatable, but I find it a a useful way to explain to myself some of the thoughts when they come up as a way of beginning to question whether or not they're actually correct. So to go back to this idea of fears and the psychological illusions that we can create inside ourselves and how to deal with these fears, I want to give you a quick story. So as you can see, I'm kind of out Not really in the middle of nowhere, but kind of in the middle of nowhere. And I have an interesting anecdote from about a week or two ago when I was down in Sedona. And uh, it's a very beautiful place, but there's an awful lot of people. And uh, I don't like doing hikes that are kind of theme park hikes. I like hikes that are strenuous and beautiful, but that there is still a sense of solitude to them. And so, you know, that leads me to be a little bit naughty. It leads me to go off and do hikes on my own off piste, right? And uh, and I found a, a beautiful, beautiful hike way off piste. And um, up in the, up in the, I don't know if you want to call them the hills or the mountains, I was already three hours away from the car, having passed maybe one or two people in those whole three hours. And uh, and then there was another kind of side side hike <laughs> that uh, that had lots of warning signs on it. You know, dangerous cliffs only do so if you're a proficient, experienced hiker. Um, you know, badly formed trail, all that kind of stuff. Now, when I go on that and I do these these hikes on my own, I am very well prepared. Okay? I am as well prepared as I can possibly be. I let someone know that I'm going. I have at least double the amount of water that I need, just in case something goes wrong and I have to stay there and drink. I have a really brilliant app on my telephone to guide me on a trail I have a spare battery for the phone and I have a wire for the battery. I have a whistle. In short, I'm as prepared as I can be. You know, I've got my good footwear, my sun cream, all that kind of stuff. So in theory, I should be enjoying this off-piste, off-off-piste extra excursion. Oh, and before I set off, I can see a map. There is a map there to explain, you know, particularly where the dangerous parts are, but also to explain exactly that it is a loop and that eventually you will get back. And the whole loop was an extra three miles or so, so it wasn't like desperately bad. 
So I'm just enjoying myself at this point, okay? I've already been out walking for, let's say, three or four hours. It's now lunchtime. I've been taking quite a lot of pictures. And, uh, and I've been using this, uh, this trail app, and of course it's blistering sunshine. It's not yet, because it's still six o'clock in the morning. Um, so my battery's already down to about 30% on my telephone, something like that. Oh, and 10 minutes before I set off, so basically nearby to this hike, there was a, one of these paths, one of these roads which are extremely rocky, which are only accessible by a, a four-wheel drive Jeep, proper off-road vehicle. And someone had, had driven past about 10 minutes earlier, and they had looked at me and kind of wound, uh, wound the window down and said, are you okay? <laughs> now, maybe this was because I have British skin, you know, and uh, and it's very, very hot and sunny. <laughs> maybe I looked a little red. Anyway, I kind of said, "Yeah, yeah I'll see if I." And they said, "Would you Would you like some extra water?" And I very confidently kind of went, "No, I'm absolutely fine. Thank you very much." And they kind of looked at me and went, "Okay," and uh, trundled away. So suddenly, I'm back on my own again. At which point my brain is already beginning to go, do you still have enough water? Because I'd be walking for a few hours, so maybe, you know, I hadn't looked, but maybe half of my water had been depleted, something like that. So I set off, okay, in full confidence that I know where I'm going, that I've got my guide and so on and so on. And it turns out that indeed this off off piste hike is pretty tricky. The previous one was tricky, but this one is particularly tricky. It's got markings on the ground from time to time, but they've been eroded, so it's hard to spot them sometimes. Indeed, there's a lot of upping and downing, and because it's hard to find the uh, the markings, you end up going much further than you thought you were going to go, and you tend to make slower progress than you thought you were going to make. So it turns out that after a couple of hours, I'm kind of wondering how far I've got, right? Am I am I making my my progress? Because it's you know, one thirty, it's getting really, really hot in the middle of the Arizona desert. Even with my sun's hat on, there is a point at which dehydration sets in. And all these thoughts are going through my head, okay? So the thoughts are am I going to run out of water? Am I going to get lost? Uh, am I gonna twist my ankle? get uh, stuck in a position, r run out of water, be parched, be mummified, and end up in the newspaper three or four days later when somebody finally walks past and finds this uh, uh, dehydrated body. Okay, that's the catastrophe which is going on inside my head. This, by the way, is the perfect example of hypnosis because what I'm doing here is... Um, Uh, how, how can I explain it? I am focusing on something that I know is untrue. But it's captured my attention to the point where my mind is wrapping around it so tightly that the reality that I can see around me somehow is less relevant than this idea that, that my brain has wrapped around. Oh, and, and, and so when I use this app on my phone... And I know I'm on a loop. For some reason that I still can't explain, every time I try, because I, 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 I wonder how far it is to get back to join the main route where I was. And every time I look on this app, it tells me to go back to where I began. I go further and further and further, and it keeps on telling me, go back. So the fear is starting to grow inside of me, okay? As the temperatures rise, as I get further away from where I remember I began from, as the app continues to tell me that I need to go back, as I'm drinking the water, and as the battery uh, on my phone is, is being depleted because I'm using the, the, the app in the full sunlight and it's using the phone. So here's my question to you, okay? And this is where the psychological fallacy comes in. My fear, I gave you my catastrophe, okay? The thought is, 
what if I get lost? Okay, that's my risk manager talking. What if I get lost? Now, I want you to consider, let's say that there are multiple Christophers, all right? I'm, I'm Christopher, in case you didn't know. So let's say that there are multiple Christophers, and I want you to consider which of these Christophers is a candidate for that thought. What, what if I get lost? Okay. Okay. Number one, Christopher. Christopher, who is wandering around on the trail, enjoying himself, soaking up the beauty. Okay. That's Christopher number one. Christopher number two, whose phone has run out of battery, who is wandering aimlessly up there, cannot find a white triangle anywhere, can't gauge north because the sun is right above me, burning down, and, uh, and who is rapidly running out of water. Okay, that's Christopher number two. Um, Christopher number three, whose phone has run out of battery. Uh, Let's do Christopher number four, who's twisted his ankle and can't walk any further. Okay. So which of those Christophers is a candidate for the thought, oh my God, what if I get lost? And really seriously consider this. Okay. Because the answer is there's only one of those Christophers that is a candidate for that thought. And it's the Christopher who's having a good time. It's the Christopher who is wandering around who doesn't have the problem. Okay? Because I assure you, Christopher whose telephone has run out is thinking of something far more serious. Christopher who's run out of water is thinking of something far more serious. Christopher who is lost, who's desperately trying to find his way back to the trail. None of them are thinking, oh, what if I get lost, right? All of them are thinking something far more practical about what on earth to do next. So the worry, by definition, is a non-event. It's not happening. Okay? Now, this is extremely useful. Okay? You can use this in many, many walks of life. So... Basically, what's going on is we're having a thought, which in my story, at least, is a sort of a risk management thought. It's trying to look after us. It's trying to take care of us. It's trying to make sure that we plan ahead. But I had planned ahead. Everything was planned ahead to the extent that it could be. But it's still ta da 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 away. So... And I'm not saying that you won't get triggered by these things, okay? Let's assume that they occur. Right? Even when you've done the work, you're still going to get triggered. What, what do you do? Okay. The, 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 the tool that I tend to use is when I have an emotional response to my thought, I am forgetting that it's a thought. Okay. When I forget that it's a thought, it feels a lot like me. And then I feel the danger attached to it, okay? There's a fly around. Yeah, when I, um, when I forget that it's a thought, when it, when it feels entirely like me, the, the, the fears bubble up. They um, uh, accentuate, they exaggerate, they become stronger. So that's my warning sign. That means to me, oh, I'm forgetting that a thought is just a thought. I'm labeling this thought as reality. And my emotions are uh, following. Another way of looking at it is, is questioning, when am I? Okay, sounds like a bit of a weird question. But when am I? Because I assure you, when you're having these fearful thoughts, you're never in the present moment. Typically, you're worrying about something which is occurring in the future. Or you're reanalyzing something from the past and telling yourself that you should have, could have, in order to make sure you don't do it again. But the point is, when you have the worry, it's not occurring. It's not occurring. And if... And I know that's hard in the moment that you're having the fear. But if you can simply take a step back and the warning sign is I'm having an emotional response. 
As soon as you notice that you're having an emotional response to a thought, where did that thought come from? Did I choose that thought? Is it correct? When am I? And I promise you, you'll realize that you are not having the problem that you thought you were. That it's a uh, potential prediction about a possible future you. And therefore, you can gain some perspective from that. And you can gain a grip on your fear as a result. That's, that's basically what happened to me. Um, so, yeah, so I kind of think that's useful. There's another type of fear. Obviously, there is this kind of... Uh, um, fear of stepping into the unknown, fear of doing something which could be potentially hazardous for some reason or another to your health, to your reputation, to your um, standing in the, the peer group, whatever it may be, uh, which is different. But it's still a protective measure, okay? So there are other perspectives that you can gain on that, um, which I'll go into in other, in, in other videos. But on this one, I wanted to identify and highlight that psychological illusion. I hope that's useful, okay? There are a few other techniques that you can use which are very much in that kind of psychological illusion vein. But the whole thing is to question, who is doing that thinking? And if you can gain a perspective, if you can see behind yourself and observe the thoughts that you're having. And this is not just applicable to fears, this is applicable to every aspect of life. Who's doing the thinking? Who's observing the thinker? Because that's you as well. But if you can observe the thinker, then you can observe the observer of the thinker and so on and so on. But you can never observe the chooser of the thought. These thoughts just appear up and some of them come to our awareness. So yes, I hope that's useful. Okay, If it is useful, then uh, let me know. If it's not entirely clear, because this is quite a complicated issue, right? Uh, then send me some questions and I'll, uh, I'll, I'll try and answer to the extent that I, that I can. Okay, and, uh, and go have a look at the other videos because I've done quite a lot now. All right, take care. Thank you. Bye.